Okay, now we're going to continue to the end of our introduction of Java server phases, and we will pick it up from where we left off, which is describing the <clears throat> six phases of the JSF lifecycle, this time in a bit more detail. So, as I said, every request that comes in goes through, uh, nominally speaking, these six different phases. As I said, in the case of errors, um, when you do it specifically because you want to, um, you can jump out of this cycle, but this is the normal cycle of handling a, an HTTP request and generating an HTTP response um, by JSF. So step one would be restore view, apply request values, then process validations, update model values. You'll notice that these are after the validations are being processed, because of course you want to have only clean data going into your model. Invoke application, essentially execute any other business rules, and then render response, which is generate the response for the user in the appropriate form. So let's look at the details. This is one, uh, this is actually a different uh, picture from the other one that we'll be focusing on. It just uh, describes the same thing in slightly different words. Basically, a request comes in to uh, FACES application. The uh, first step is the restoring the view. Then you submit the form values. Uh, the component values are converted. <coughs> the values are validated. Then, assuming it passed that point, then the values are um, bound to the backing bean properties, as you've seen in your um, tutorials and samples so far. Then any application level events get handled, the methods are invoked, the navigation outcome, that is where does the view come from next, uh, happens here, and then the um, response is rendered. The view picks up its values from the backing beam properties in the model and the response is generated. So restore view this phase is responsible for constructing or reconstructing this is in fact where that term post back comes from um, if the view is being redisplayed after an error so the view that the user last saw is uh, created as an internal data structure within the uh, Java EE app server. Step two, apply the request values. That component tree tries to apply the request parameters that came along with the form um, uh, or in the URL <coughs> from the user to each of the corresponding components that um, correspond to those things. So in other words, the input fields that I typed into have a UI component corresponding to that in the tree. The checkboxes that they checked, the radio buttons that they pushed, all have corresponding components in the tree. And then the first step is to try to update those values. <clears throat> the, um, this is where the conversion errors um, might actually happen. So in fact, if Again, your field is expecting to have strings and you're putting in numbers. Well, actually, that's not as good an, uh, an example if it's the other way around. If it's expecting numbers and you're putting in strings or if you have some more complicated uh, conversion routines, then this is where that would happen. If, in fact, the conversion um, generates an error, uh, any one of the components generates an error, then the uh, errors for that, the error messages for that particular uh, component, as a matter of fact, that's all of them, um, get queued up <coughs> and they all get attached to the response that goes back to the user. That's in fact how uh, one of the ways the user um, gets information back from the system. Then process validations, assuming you passed step two, each component um, has a validator. Many of them, you know, they're very easy to add. You can simply say required equals true um, in the attribute uh, up to writing your own very complex validation. 
um, each component that has a validator associated with it are checked against the rules. If there are any validation errors, those are queued up and then we go to render response. This is, as I showed you, is where the cycle uh, jumps um, right to the render response phase because there's really no point in going on if in fact the errors get caught earlier in the process. Then step four. <clears throat> uh, this is the time when the manage bean properties that correspond to the input components um, um, get updated, okay? Because now they've been converted properly, <clears throat> they've been validated, so um, if any errors happen here, which could still happen, then again, those errors are queued up, they're stuck on to the, um, the response that goes back to the user and it's sent back. Five invoke applications. Any application level methods, so these would be the actual, for example, an action is one of these, um, and any events, you know, on blur, on change, um, any of those JavaScript type events, um, or I mean the obvious ones like a page submit or a redirection to another page. Um, that's where this happens in step five. <coughs> and then lastly, um, the render response. This is where everything goes ultimately, um, uh, particularly things that have errors associated with them. So the um, uh, page uh, is rendered for the user with the current state of the model values. If there are any errors, as I said, those will go back uh, to the user as well. <coughs> so here is our diagram again showing those things is step one, two, three, four, and five. Um, going to step six, which is the render portion, and we'll look at these in a little bit more detail, exactly how this works, so restore view. Restore view, JSF, if it's the first time the page has been seen for this user, then it creates the data structure, wires the event handlers that it needs to watch out for, and the validators to the components. It saves the view in something called a faces context object instance. The reason I mention this is because in fact programmatically you'll need to access the, the, uh, this object occasionally in order to perhaps, uh, for example, if you want to put in your own error messages, um, this is uh, the object you need to get access to in order to attach the error messages. Um, and so the um, uh, everything uh, from this point on also has access to this faces context instance. And uh, it, uh, as I said, it has an, a number of methods associated with it. Um, probably the most important one is the error messages. So <clears throat> at this point, this is the um, initial request versus postback. So those are the two different possibilities. If it's an initial request, that's the first time they click on something. The postback requests, if they are uh, coming back the second time or the third time or the tenth time as a result of an initial request. <clears throat> so typically that happens when there are errors in the uh, forms, for example. When the lifecycle gets one of these initial requests, it, acts, uh, it executes only um, the restore view and render response phases. Now you might say, well, why did it skip over all the rest of those things? Well, in fact, because it's the initial request, there's nothing there yet. <laughs> there's no interaction with the, with the user um, because the page has just been created, so they haven't had an opportunity to actually type something into it yet. Remember, this is a cycle, so it keeps going around and around and around, and you, know, you have to pick some place to start. Um, so at this point, just imagine this is the, the first page that they see. It has to be, that would be the initial request, and it has to be uh, created and filled out with any values that the system puts in there. Um, but the user hasn't had an opportunity to interact with it yet. Um, however, if it is a postback, in other words, this is not the first time that the user has been there, then it goes and executes all of the standard lifecycle phases in turn. So step two is apply request values. The request values are the ones that are coming along with the request either as post 
parameters or as get parameters um, that come as part of the query string uh, as part of the URL. So assuming the component tree has been restored, this is for a postback request, each component gets its new value from the request parameters by using this method and then the value is stored locally um, in the tree. Okay, So this is where the um, values that the user has typed in get associated with a component in the tree. They haven't, remember, haven't uh, get associated with the backing bean yet. That happens later on. If um, a conversion fails, then there's an uh, error associated with that. It's attached to faces context, and this message will be available <coughs> to be displayed along um, with everything else at the render response phase. Um, and then also any validation errors, etc., would also uh, be tacked on as they happen later on. If some components have what is called the immediate attribute set to true, that's something you, you can say um, in one of your um, components, one of your widgets, then the uh, these validations, conversions, event handling, uh, etc., um, will essentially um, you can short circuit the, them so that they don't bother. In other words, if you see a conversion error, then you can simply say, um, "Okay, send me the messages back from that, and don't bother doing anything else. Just come right back." So that's one way you can. Um, use this. Another case is what is called a partial request and those are usually generated by these AJAX calls. The partial context is retrieved and the partial processing method is applied. That's internal within the life cycle. This is what allows you to retrieve simply parts of pages as necessary without having to go through the entire process otherwise. Step 3, process validations. At this point, all the validators that have been registered with the components um, are executed. It checks every component uh, against the rules that you've defined for it. <coughs> if any of them is invalid or if, if any of the conversion fails, which was just before this, um, adds error messages for that and then again jumps right to step six so that um, there's no reason to go on from that point. If there were conversion errors from the apply request values phase, the messages are also displayed here. Okay, So here's an example of, of a message that would get sent back <coughs> at a, this point uh, directly to the user. Next up, update model values. Well, now we should have clean data because it's converted properly past all the validations. Um, and so then what it does is it sets the values in the backing beans properly so that um, the model has uh, clean clean data. Okay. Um, if for some reason there's an error at this point, um, then likewise the um, uh, lifecycle jumps right to render response and then any errors that came uh, with it are ready to be displayed. Step five, invoke application. <clears throat> Any business logic, application level events um, are handled, like submitting a form or linking to another page. <clears throat> this is sort of the highest level of what the user sees. If there are any errors here, they also get queued to this uh, object so that they can be transmitted along to the user. And then, uh, assuming everything goes correctly, um, the uh, full render response will happen and that completes the life cycle for that particular page. Render response of course this is JSF building the view and it determines who in, a, in its um, uh, list of view managers is responsible for rendering that particular page. If it's an initial request again this is the other end of the cycle the components are represented uh, that are represented on the page will be added to the tree. So this is the when the tree initially gets built. Otherwise, it's a postback. Um, that is the case here, where it's a postback and there were errors. The original page is rendered again. 
if the page contains um, these tags, which is something I would recommend that you put near or um, on top of or below, uh, depending upon where you how you want to set up your error uh, messaging. Um, <clears throat> these would be associated with the particular fields that generated the errors. So, for example, H message is uh, associated with a particular field, and H messages is a list, It's an, in fact it's an unordered list in HTML terms, a UL, of all of the error messages. So if you wanted to bunch all of your error messages for all of the mistakes they make in one place, <clears throat> you can use H messages and let's say put it at the top of the page. If there are no messages, then nothing would be displayed. If there are messages, they would appear um, above, let's say, your form, and then they could fix the messages. Uh, personally, uh, I mean, that's functional, but personally, I think it's probably better to put the error message near the thing that caused the error message. And so more likely what you should be doing is putting near each of the widgets in your forms, let's say, an H message corresponding to that particular widget so that in fact if during the cycle the uh, error messages are getting tacked on to the response, then they would be associated with each of the fields in turn and um, you could make them red, you can make them bold, you can um, you know, do whatever you want to them and more importantly you can put them near where the error actually happened so it's a, a good user interface uh, uh, tip. <clears throat> the one last thing that happens after the view is rendered, the state of the response is saved so that subsequent requests can access it. So that's an important thing because uh, this is what allows the postbacks to actually make sense so that you don't have to recreate the initial state every single time if there are errors. Okay? Um, it also creates overhead, if you think about it, on the server side that um, some people would complain about uh, from a performance point of view, but um, there are ways of, of saving this state not um, only on the server but also um, to have the client take some responsibility for it, but that's a performance issue we're not really going to get into too much. So here we are, uh, that's the end of the cycle. We'll talk a little bit about Manage Beans, we've talked about this before. Remember, Manage Bean is a uh, plain old Java object registered with Java EE. That's the annotations that do that. They contain getters and setters. Um, they can have business logic in them too. <coughs> uh, and sometimes, in most of the examples we've seen so far, they're acting as backing beans. Uh, but they don't necessarily only act as backing beans. They can act in other ways too. Um, but the, uh, when they act as backing beans, what you're doing again is associating with the fields uh, that the user sees and, and interacts with, with a, an object, a bean, on the server side. So the nice thing about this is then JSF manages all of the transferring and updating of the form values um, and you don't have to because otherwise, uh, for example, in many action-oriented frameworks, you would have to do that yourself. So the beans are considered um, normally part of the model, uh, part of the MVC um, pattern. Um, they are uh, registered using either the at sign annotations or and this was the way it was done previously, but it um, can still be done this way if you want. Um, their faces um, dash config.xml configuration file can actually be used to define them. Um, as I said a couple of times, the and this is for historical reasons, there are actually two ways of creating these managed beans. One is the original JSF method, which existed before the CDI. Um, but nowadays the CDI framework has uh, is going to uh, already started to supersede the managed bean framework in JSF and so generally speaking if you're going to need a managed bean you probably would use the CDI version the at sign named um, from now on. <coughs> um, just to review the scoping <coughs> the idea is how long does a 
uh, an object, one of these bean objects last, when does it get created, when does it get destroyed, and who has access to it in the meantime. There are um, uh, a list of scopes that go from pretty much the most specific, the shortest lived, out all the way to the most general, most accessible, longest lived. Um, so we are going to go from none scoped to application scoped um, with a bunch of other ones in between. <coughs> um, if you needed one uh, bean that lived just for the length of a single uh, expression language evaluation, this is what you would use. Though that's um, kind of rare that you need that, but uh, it, the capability is there. More typically, if you want to have a bean live as long as the uh, request and response is being managed, that is the request scope. That's very common. Um, minimally, you would probably use that for most form kind of data. Then, uh, this is a somewhat newer uh, scoping. This is as long as the uh, user is still interacting with that same particular view, the bean will live. This, in other words, it can be longer than the request scoping, uh, but shorter than the next one, which is session scoped. As long as the user's session lives, and remember that is something that's controlled by the uh, application server when it first notices that a user is, is making requests, um, it will create a session so as to be able to create that conversation. So it generates a unique session ID and that session ID gets associated with the requests as long as the session is still active. Um, <clears throat> and <coughs> the session, uh, as I said, uh, will last as long as the user um, keeps interacting with the system. If there is a period of time when they stop interacting based upon the server's timeout value, the um, session object will still stay uh, around. If the timeout gets exceeded, the session object will be destroyed. Or, and we actually saw an example of this, you can do this programmatically, um, which is what happened in our uh, Duke's guessing game um, uh, application. Um, in that case, there was code in there that said, oh, they guessed the value, it's time let them uh, start a new session and that would essentially start a new quiz and that was done programmatically if you remember that. <clears throat> then we have application scoped so as long as the web application is running that is the whole application the bean is created once the first request is made or um, if you want to create it right off the bat you can say eager equals true as an attribute um, then it'll get created uh, before anybody even asks for it and it gets destroyed only when the web application shuts down. Nominally, these are only used um, or generally used for things that are um, read-only to an entire application. So a good thing that for, uh, for application scoping would be uh, lists of, of things that you would uh, be putting into forms like state lists or country codes or you know common things that are really not going to change while the application is alive. Um, <clears throat> and then the nice thing about that <clears throat> is then every single page from every part of your application can access it uh, with no problem um, and it's also very uh, performance friendly because there's only one copy of it shared amongst all of the different um, requesters. So there's a there's a place for that. Custom scoped, this is something um, that's not used quite as much. It, it's sort of a, um, a way of, of writing your own scoping mechanism to some extent. Um, in general, we don't see this being used quite so much because nowadays uh, this next one, conversation scoping, uh, which is not part of the JSF managed beam uh, infrastructure, but is only part of the CDI, infrastructure. And what this means is the bean lives while the user interacts with a set of uh, what you would call long-running pages. And th the definition of, of a uh, set of pages that are part of this long-running component, that's up to you. 
okay? So it's a very nice thing in the sense that if you have, um, you know, three or four pages in a row which make up uh, in your application some kind of logical um, set of steps. In other words, if they're filling out a, a long application form and then there's a page one and a page two and a page three, um, what you can do is create a conversation scope, and here's an, a quickie uh, skeleton for, for that. You would create a conversation scoped bean that um, um, where you define the start of the conversation, that's the conversation begin that you see at the bottom left hand side, and then your uh, application would go on and go through, you know, the first set of pages and the second set of pages and the third set of pages, etc., until uh, you hit a logical ending point for you, and then you would call the end conversation method that you wrote here, and that would uh, effectively uh, terminate the length of this, uh, or the, terminate the life of this particular bean, and it would go away. So it's sort of something in the middle with a lot of uh, uh, control um, over it uh, by you and specifying exactly how it's used. So that goes over the basic cycle of how JSF handles a request and generates a response, talks a little bit or reminds you a bit about the scopes, the managed beans um, that uh, are used during that process. And the last thing I wanted to do was just quickly go over some of these basic tags that are part of JSF um, and just mention a few that I thought were um, of particular note that you might want to pay more attention to and read some more about. Again, there's a chapter on the uh, basic tags of JSF in our core JSF book, and I would refer you to that to get the details for this, but um, just to give me an opportunity to um, <clears throat> highlight a few things. So for example, a, uh, one of the ones that you would see perhaps is f colon attribute, and what that allows you to do is add attributes to an, a component of widget as needed. Um, uh, likewise, f colon param that is um, something you also would allow you to add parameter values that then get passed on to the server side uh, and associated with that particular widget. Um, you have a bunch of listeners, I won't go into these here, we can talk about them another time, but uh, this is one of the ways that you can associate a particular JavaScript type of, of action. Um, the ones that you may have seen uh, if you write JavaScript uh, and browser code. So the on blur, on change, <coughs> um, those sorts of things. Um, you can actually associate a particular piece of code on the server side with one of those activities. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? We have, um, we have date and time conversions that you can use. Um, that make sure you can get the uh, data in exactly the formats that you want. Um, adds a validator, this is an important one, uh, along with the other validate ones below it. Um, the the uh, validate double range, long range length required uh, uh, validate bean, those are the ones that you might use more often. Um, uh, some, of the, uh, some of those are, are the built-in ones for basic uh, <clears throat> field length and, and minimum and maximum values. The validator is um, something that allows you to write your own custom validator and associate it with a particular component. Um, let's see what else. Load bundle. This is a way of loading those, um, oh, for example, those messaging bundles for the different languages. You can actually do it on a page by page basis. Um, let's see what else do we have. Uh, F select item. This is actually where this gets used is when you have a widget that's, for example, a, uh, <clears throat> a checkbox or a radio button or a list box. Um, if you want to specify the choices right then and there inside your widget um, on your uh, JSF page, 
this is the way that you could specify um, the uh, values for it, for what they can choose from. <coughs> select items is um, uh, the same idea, except you can select uh, multiple items. The F Ajax, again, that's important because it allows you to uh, update pages um, uh, partially without having to update them completely. Um, I, we'd have to go over some examples to appreciate what that does. Um, view param is useful if you want to bookmark pages. Um, you can use the view param as part of um, the one below it, the metadata at the top of the of your page, and effectively those view parameters are um, tacked on to the URLs of your uh, requests for your pages. So in other words, the the query string type of syntax where you've got, you know, the URL path and then you've got the page and then you've got question mark, something equals something, ampersand, something equals something, ampersand, something equals something. Those are the view params that you can set. And the reason I mention this is because this is a way that you can actually generate pages that can be bookmarked, okay, because they will become part of the URL itself. <coughs> um, this is the uh, H library of tags um, that we've been seeing. There are basically corresponding values for most of the, the important parts of a standard form, head, body, form. Um, then you have ones that don't exist, uh, that give extra capabilities. Uh, a lot of them have to do with forms or retrieving things from the outside world. Uh, for example, output style sheet, output script uh, is a convenient way of storing uh, your and referring to uh, your style sheets or your JavaScript libraries. Then most of these have to do with <coughs> managing forms, um, the input and the uh, error messages. So uh, quickly as you can see, it's, it's fairly obvious, input text is a single box, input text area is a multi-line input box, input secret or passwords, uh, hidden field, this is, uh, again, this is something uh, you actually saw an example of it. If you want to pass data back and forth between your pages or, or the browser and the server um, that the user has no interaction with but is, are important to you, then you could use input hidden. But in, that's different from input secret, that's an actual control uh, for passwords. Output label is uh, associated with a, another component uh, for, this will be the label, and output link is a under, um, underlined link. Uh, output format, you can use, this is a little more sophisticated version of the, um, the formatting of text. Um, and then uh, output text is simply paragraph style output. Um, then come the command uh, links and command buttons, um, and then their equivalent H button and H link. The basic difference here is this. The ones that are called command button and command link generate in the form where they are um, <coughs> post uh, post uh, uh, methods, okay, or they use post methods as part of the HTTP request. H button and H link, and this could be important to you, generate get requests, all right? So if you really need a, um, a get request, in other words, you're not updating data on the uh, server side, you're simply making a request for information, let's say, um, you're more likely to use an H button or an H link. Down at the bottom are the two uh, message related ones. As I said, <coughs> Uh, the single H message is associated with a particular message for a particular component, and H messages uh, will display all the messages for all of the components in a single block. Graphic image, this is, allows you, this is the um, HTML IMG um, uh, tag. Select one list box, it lets you select one thing from list box, select one menu, very similar. If you look at the picture here, I think you'll see the difference. Um, basically, the uh, list box shows a list, 
the select one menu normally shows just one value and then <clears throat> the list drops down when you start to select. Select one radio, radio buttons, Boolean checkbox, that's a checkbox and you can have a set of, of checkboxes. Many checkbox, that's what this is. Uh, many list box, this is a multi-select list box and as opposed to the one at the top. This allows you to select multiple things from the list. Uh, you know how to do that. You can, um, uh, if you click, that will select something. If you um, shift click, that will select things between two values. If you control click, that allows you to select, um, like in this example, pickle and lettuce, which are not uh, contiguous in the list. Um, select many menu, um, and honestly, this is not really used very much because it's kind of awkward and people, uh, it's a little hard to see how this works. Um, usually you would use one of the other many uh, <coughs> list box um, choices above. <coughs> the panel grid and panel group go together. The, these actually create, at least in the current version of JSF, they create tables uh, for, your, uh, for your forms to allow you to line up things properly. Panel group uh, allows you to put, normally speaking, it's a one-to-one, -one, uh, if you think of it, a uh, panel grid like an HTML table, every widget, every component would take up a cell in the table, okay, one right after the other. Um, a panel group allows you to, to group uh, two or more components together and essentially put them in one cell in the table. Data table, very important, we'll get back to that. Um, it allows you to take a, um, an, a data object from the server, like a map or a list or something like that, and display it in an easy way as a uh, rows and columns table. <coughs> Associated with that is a uh, um, column. That would be a particular column. Um, and then lastly here are the, um, the UI namespace for facelets. <clears throat> These all have to do with uh, creating templates and um, defining areas within the templates um, and then doing the insertion, um, specifying where things go inside the templates. Um, one thing I, I'll point out is, uh, normally speaking, you use UI component, UI define, UI insert, UI composition. <clears throat> that is uh, for full templating. Um, and usually speaking, the way this works is that you uh, would put everything inside a UI composition. Um, uh, when you're defining these uh, facelets, as you'll see in the chapter on facelets in your textbook, and then um, everything outside of that would be, um, uh, outside of that bounded area in your page would basically be ignored by JSF. Okay, so that's the way facelets works. <coughs> However, um, if you use UI decorate and UI fragment instead, um, where, where it makes some sense to do this sometimes, though it's not the typical way, um, the difference is that if you use UI decorate instead, then it doesn't ignore the content outside of that tag. Okay, so if there's regular HTML surrounding your um, your UI um, uh, decorate group, your UI fragment group, or UI decorate group, then that will also be passed through to um, the uh, renderer uh, and eventually sent over to the browser. <coughs> um, here is one that's actually very useful sometimes, though usually you would want to use, uh, if you can, use data tables or some form of uh, Prime Faces has very nice uh, table tags. Um, but if there are times when you really want to do your own um, iteration through something, through a list um, that you created, or an array, or a map, <coughs> um, then you can use this facelets um, namespace tag called UI Repeat. And basically what it does is it allows you to create kind of your own uh, for loop, right? So that you can, or your own while loop, and allows you to then um, say on this 
list object, I want to pick off each item, and then you can do whatever you want inside your JSF with that. So it's, it's quite flexible, um, and it's the preferred way of doing manual stepping through these objects if you need to. Um, one other thing that's kind of interesting sometimes if you're running into problems is this UI debug. If you put this in your code, um, what it allows you to do is that if you hit control shift, normally it's D, um, it will display a page for you that has some information about the current scope information, the current uh, component tree, the way, what the system thinks it is and, and what the values are. Um, and um, that uh, can be helpful occasionally to try to figure out if you're having a problem. <clears throat> and lastly, this could be also useful um, in, a, in a kind of a, uh, uh, a interesting debugging way is UI remove. That says anything between UI remove and sl uh, slash UI remove in that side of that block, inside of that element, um, don't include in the rendering. Okay, and basically what that does is it allows you, if you're, um, you know, building pages piece by piece, or if you're having some issues with getting them right, you can simply, uh, it's essentially a comment. Uh, you can comment out in a JSF way portions of your JSF pages so that they're not uh, processed until that remove is uh, taken out. Okay, so, and that actually might come in handy too. And the last thing I wanted to mention uh, was again this JSTL core tag lib. Uh, these are the Java server pages um, um, libraries that uh, have been used for a long time to do various things. <clears throat> I, I'm not going to go over them in detail here, but I think you can see, um, for example, the uh, choose, uh, if, um, otherwise, um, those, when, those are all associated with putting some logic into your pages. Now, this is not necessarily a good idea to put too much logic because then you'd be breaking the MVC model. <clears throat> but occasionally it does make sense for simple things to uh, be able to put some logic in your views themselves. Um, the other things, uh, let me see what else is here. Um, mm, uh, there, I mean, there are some uses for this, so I, I just wanted to introduce this to you. Um, there's another one. This actually you might use more frequently. This is another tag lib. This namespace fn colon um, is, as you can see, these are all pretty much string handling related um, subroutines. And uh, this does make sense if you want to be able to, to do some things <coughs> in your output that would require, you know, translating things to all to uppercase or to lowercase or um, joining together to um, two things or splitting things apart based on a separator. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a little um, string handling toolkit that might come in handy on your views. So, uh, if you need more uh, pointers, here are a few references to the core JSF um, uh, ref card that comes with the book, the formal JSF API documentation, the formal facelets documentation. <clears throat> there is a, um, a version of um, another face faces type library which um, is has uh, essentially is the model for a lot of what you see in current JSF faces. I just happen to like the the way that the documentation is written in it would apply in this case too. This actually comes from the Apache um, group um, that's called My Faces, but the, t the tags are the same. And then um, if you look under this documentation, you can, uh, for the managed beans, you'll get some more details as to um, how they work and uh, some of the innards of uh, how they operate. So at any rate, so that polishes off the basic introduction to JSF, so you should have a good idea of the essential capabilities of what it could do. Obviously, there's a lot more if you want to write your own custom validators, or you need to write your own custom converters, <coughs> or you need to do some fancy 
templating, uh, etc. And then, of course, is all of the extra uh, look and feel um, that you would add using cascading style sheets and um, the other fancy um, interaction that you would do using JavaScript libraries. But this essentially is the basic toolkit that you can use to write your applications. And of course, you will have to figure out what your domain logic is so that you would embed in your Java code uh, in the beans on the server side and in the enterprise Java beans, the EJBs. But uh, hopefully now you have a basic idea of how um, the whole um, arena looks and then we'll focus on components of it. For example, how do you hook your uh, application into uh, a relational database. <clears throat> we'll dig into how JPA works and various other specific uh, tasks. Again, if you have any questions, just email me, call me. I'll be happy to respond and uh, I'll see you pretty much next time.